But if you're in a city, it's like, why make every single drone carry all the collision avoidance capabilities on their own, right? Why not just build it into the network of the city? And so that you've got complete situational awareness for anything that's flying. You're listening to the Drone Radio Show podcast, the show about drones and the people who use them for business, fun and research. Hosted by Randy Goers. Hello, everyone. This is Randy Goers, and welcome to the Drone Radio Show podcast, episode 266. Can a smart city make flying drones easier and safer? That's the question we explore today with Eben Frankenberg, CEO and co-founder of Echodyne Corporation. Echodyne is a five-year-old company that makes revolutionary compact radar sensors for a range of applications for commercial, defense, and government customers. Their high-performance radars combine patented technology and powerful intelligent software to achieve maximum radar performance. Echodyne radars are used in the autonomous vehicle, perimeter and border security, security integrator, airspace management, UAS service suppliers, and commercial unmanned air traffic systems industries. Eben has over 20 years' experience starting and growing technology companies. Prior to founding Echodyne, Eben was an entrepreneur in residence at Intellectual Ventures, where he created and incubated new companies, including Echodyne Corp. and several other leading startups. In this edition of the Drone Radio Show, Eben talks about how smart cities data network. In this edition of the Drone Radio Show, Eben talks about smart city data networks and how they could play a role in supporting unmanned air flight operations in urban environments. But before we hear from Eben, I want to thank those of you who are supporting my funding campaign. Whether it's a dollar, $100, or much more, you can help defray the cost of production and keep the podcast going and growing. Go to DroneRadioShow.com slash donate. So let's find out how smart cities can make flying drones easier and safer with Eben Frankenberg of Echodyne. Let's pick up the interview where I ask Eben to introduce himself. My name is Eben Frankenberg, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Echodyne. Eben, can you tell us about Echodyne Corporation? Yeah, so Echodyne is a radar company, and we got into radar because of this move towards autonomous systems that we're seeing across the board. I mean, you know, there's the, the autonomous aerial vehicles, there are autonomous ground vehicles, there are also autonomous security systems that people are installing, where you're looking at a bunch of sensors essentially feeding, you know, these algorithms to give you machine perception, what what's going on in the world around me. And you need to have that in, in order for things to navigate through the world or you know, to give yourself uh, an indicator that somebody's in your space that isn't supposed to be there, whether it's a ground threat or an air threat, et cetera. And one of the best sensors for doing that kind of thing, understanding, you know, your surroundings, especially in the outdoor world is radar, but it's been limited to either sort of really high performing radars that are really expensive, which the military uses, and then commercial radars, which tend to be much simpler from a performance standpoint and lower performing. And so we came up with a way to make high performing radars at commercial price points, which we think are going to be super relevant to a bunch of these autonomy markets. Today, we want to talk about the smart city within the context of drones. But first of all, from your perspective, Evan, what do you consider a definition of a smart city? Well, I should probably be asking you that question instead of vice versa um, as a city planner. But <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, I have this vision of smart cities, which um, maybe seems a little science fiction-y, but, you know, drones flying all over, delivering, you know, goods and services, the uh, air mobility vehicles that are flying around, obviously self-driving cars, um, ride-sharing vehicles all being fully autonomous. You know, that's sort of the vision of, of a smart city, in my mind. How do smart cities make what you described happen? Yeah, so they're sort of two types of UAVs that people talk about in the smart city context. One is the smaller drones that people would use to deliver packages, deliver, you know, medical supplies or samples, 
food, et cetera. And then there are the large urban air mobility vehicles, which are designed to carry passengers you know, from one location to another, sort of an air taxi service or shared service, you know, ride sharing service. Um, and obviously those two devices are completely different. You know, one's got a five pound payload and one's got a six person payload. So very different, very different concepts of operations that you have to think about. What do you think has to happen before we can see drones moving people or delivering goods in cities? Unfortunately, there's a lot that has to happen. They're also quite different, you know, with these two types of devices. In the smaller UAV device that's delivering packages, you're typically thinking about many locations to many other locations, right? So if you were to say every Grubhub or Uber Eats delivery, you know, from a restaurant could go to any random address anywhere in a city, you've got a a serious many-to-many problem that you have to solve. In the urban air mobility side, you know, it may be from hub to hub, right? From the airport to a helipad downtown somewhere on, you know, on top of a building or, you know, to a dozen helipads, something like that. And so, That, in the end, may actually end up being a little easier because it's a much, much bigger device. In the small drone situation, you've got, you know, tons of these small devices flying around and they're all, you know, going from from a semi-random location to another semi-random location. So the big thing for that one is going to be, and really for the first one too, but especially for the second one, small drones, is going to be airspace situational awareness right, which is just understanding everything that's moving around in the airspace at any given time. And that's the, you know, sort of collision protection system that's got to be running to make sure you know, here's where all the drones are, here's here's where airplanes are, here's where medical helicopters are, here's where the urban air mobility vehicles are, and knowing where they all are at any given point. Now, one of the concepts that you and I shared as we prepared for this podcast is that cities can actually use their smart data networks to communicate with drones, thereby helping them navigate through the urban landscape. Can you expand on that? If you think about the small drones, for let's just refer to it as package delivery, but if you think about package delivery in a city, you know, you you could say, all right, well, Amazon's, Walmart's, Costco's, you know, whatever, you know, drugstores, chains, et cetera. If they all wanted to do package delivery, does each one of them have to have, you know, this build this complete airspace situational awareness independently? And then, you know, they fund it. And so then they sort of have their proprietary network that they can use for all this data to fly. Or is that a, you know, combined system? Right. They could either be managed by a city or managed by, yeah, you know, I mean, it could be somebody like a cell phone company, right? A wireless company who's got towers all over the city. And you, know, you could imagine putting a network of radars around the city, looking out at the airspace and then networking those together, just like you do the wireless comms links, and then have this sort of federated system that people could subscribe to. And so you could easily imagine a city feeding that kind of information off to these various you know, companies, retailers who want, who want access to the airspace. That makes sense, especially now, because in a lot of cities, wireless providers are upgrading to 5G. And depending on the size, those 5G wireless antenna poles could be used to house the sensors needed to communicate with drones. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and these radars are about the size of a moleskin notebook. So, I mean, they're smaller than most of the cell. I mean, certainly any of the big cell tower antennas that you see, these things are, you know, tiny fractions of the size. Yeah, one of the challenges that people think about with drones operating safely out of sight of the operator, um, this whole beyond visual line of sight, there's sort of two models you can imagine. One is that each drone individually has the collision avoidance capacity sort of built into the drone itself. And if you're thinking about like flying some really long linear feature like power lines for 50 miles or something like that, you know, it may make sense that you have a bunch of sensors on the actual individual aircraft and then it's flying that long pattern by itself rather than trying to instrument it from the ground, right? And then have that whole linear feature piece of infrastructure instrumented. But if you're in a city, it's like, why, why make every single drone carry all the collision avoidance capabilities on their own, 
right? Why not just build it into the network of the city? And so that you've got complete situational awareness for anything that's flying, right? Um, It just makes more sense. And carrying a whole bunch of sensors, making sure they all work on every single drone is a lot of sort of capital requirement for, you know, all those drones to have that on them and payload that they have to carry, et cetera. We tend to talk about these systems within the context of drone deliveries or where beyond visual line of sight applications are needed. But it seems to me that this type of interconnected network could be a value to operators that are doing anything in the urban environment. If it gives them greater situational awareness, that should allow them to do traditional tasks more effectively and with greater safety. No, that's absolutely true. I mean, the, the sort of holy, I don't know, it's the holy grail, but the, the key to the safety case is knowing what's in the airspace, where it is, what it is and when. So just knowing what's happening in the airspace. And, you know, there are, like I said, sort of two ways you can get it. One, you put that onus on every on every drone that's that's operating. So it has to independently figure all that out by itself. Or you build this network and say, hey, there's a network available that covers this whole geographic area. And we know what's happening in the airspace in that entire geographic area. And then people can subscribe to it, right? Okay, I want to know it. In large part, that is this whole concept of UTM, right, that NASA has been pushing and lots of people have been working on, UAV traffic management system, that the idea is, hey, there's a system that, you know, keeps track of everything that's flying and they share with each other who's flying where. And so having that situational awareness would be tremendous for the industry. So the data that would be transmitting to the drone from the network is really about what's in the airspace. Is that correct? Correct. So you would see, you know, if I'm a a particular delivery drone and I need to go from point A to point B, this UTM system that everyone's talking about, you would register your flight path. I'm going from A to B and I start flying there. But then if you had a network system that was doing this airspace surveillance, you would be feeding into that, hey, uh, there's a radar on this cell tower and it's picked up something flying over here that's not registered. Well, that's because it's a hobbyist, some hobby drone flyer who's flying their drone in a particular area, but the radar is now picked it up. And so that ends up in this UTM system so that when the drone is trying to go from point A to point B, it it knows, oh, there's something in the way and here's its altitude and I'm either going to fly above it or I need to change my flight path and go around it somehow, right? And that's what those systems are designed to be able to do. The challenge is how do you provide this airspace awareness of what all is going on in the airspace? Frankly, if you're talking about a metropolitan area, the easiest way to do it is to try to, you know, build up a a networked infrastructure as part of this smart city approach to say, okay, yeah, the city is covered, right? And we know the situational awareness, airspace awareness at any given point. Is it similar to the navigation systems that we currently have in our cars, where they're continually being updated, even to account for traffic accidents or rerouting and so forth? So the idea of um, the traffic system, navigational system, knowing where accidents are or where there's high density traffic, et cetera, and then doing rerouting, that rerouting part is really part of this UTM system where it's keeping track of what's flying and where it's going. And then if there's an issue that needs to be dealt with, it'll handle the sort of rerouting. That's what these UTM systems are supposed to do. But what you also need to have is the whole network of sensors that's saying, here's where those problems are. And in the ground navigational sense, you have city cameras, you have other uh, radars that are tracking speed of vehicles moving, things like that. And then you're also getting feeds from the cars themselves, uh, obviously, that are updating these systems that then tell you, okay, we've got you know high traffic flow or whatever. So it, it is definitely analogous to that, where you have a bunch of sensors that are sending data in to this network, and then you've got a net that can sort of respond. Do we have all of the technology in place to construct this network? Um, They're getting close. I mean, I think they're getting close now. We work on sort of both of these types of con ops that I talked about with drones. So we have one product, which is a small radar, which is designed to be mounted on the drone itself. So if you're doing a long linear infrastructure inspection like a pipeline or power lines, you could mount a radar on the drone and then give it 
individually collision avoidance capabilities. And then we have another radar, which, which you can mount on the ground in a very networkable fashion. So you can have lots of them mounted in different places around an area and then be using those for this sort of airspace situational awareness. And we've done a number of tests with you know, approaching dozens of these radars all networked together to cover a sort of downtown core. One was with the Lone Star Center of Excellence down in Corpus Christi, Texas. And we did another one in San Diego, which I won't go into much detail on, but both had many, many radars sort of looking out over the airspace to give you sort of full situational awareness. So the technology is definitely getting there. One big question is who funds the sort of development of these kinds of projects, right? Does the city fund this, you know, setting up this network for situational awareness? Do the retailers and, and you know, delivery companies fund it? Or does some independent third party fund it and then charge, charge for it as a service? You know, that's a big question that still has to be worked out. And then you have to get the FAA has to also, of course, be comfortable that there is enough situational awareness that you can safely operate all these things without incident. I think there are more regulatory and sort of economic questions that are still to be worked out than there are technological, although I won't say everything's solved. You know, there's still some problems that need to be figured out. And of course, cybersecurity is also a threat. What do we need to know in that area? Yeah, I'm sure there's a whole cyber community that will will point out all the risks there, and they're certainly valid risks. You know, depending on the size of the drone, I mean, if you have a, a cyber issue with an urban air mobility vehicle, that's going to be probably a lot more problematic than an individual, you know, small package delivery drone with a five-pound payload. But either way, if that falls out of the sky, there's damage that's going to get caused. So you absolutely have to be worried about it. I mean, the other topic which we haven't really touched on yet is also, you know, the rogue drone operator that has bad actions in mind, right? So it's one of the big challenges that the FAA has to deal with is if we start letting all these drones fly, well, then how do you detect friend versus foe, you know, friendly law-abiding drone versus not? And having that airspace awareness is a big benefit in either case. Right. So if you had that situational awareness of the airspace and said, hey, based on radar, I know what's flying and where it is at any given location, you'll also have other sensors like ADSB transponders or another kind of RFID sort of capability where the drone is broadcasting who it is and where it is and that kind of thing. And so the friendlies are going to, you're going to be able to coordinate that information, right? To say, okay, well, my radar says I'm seeing something at this location. And yeah, there's a friendly drone that says it's flying from this warehouse to this endpoint at that location right now. So I know that's the one. Well, what is this one over here? I'm getting no signals from that. So is that a friend or a foe? And so that becomes, yeah, you know, it's another big issue that people have to deal with is and think through is, okay, with more drones in the sky, how do you separate the good ones from the bad ones if there are, in fact, bad ones out there, which we know there are at times. In addition to providing enhanced situation awareness, are there other things that the city itself can do to help defer potential rogue drones? A lot of the problems that I think people have seen to date with some of these rogue drones have been really just hobbyists that were kind of clueless, right? And a lot of people talk about the clueless, the careless, and the I don't know, convicts. I can't remember what the last C was. C is, but the, you know, criminals, criminals, not convicts. Yeah. So the clueless, the careless, and the criminal as sort of the three categories of drone operators. And the clueless ones just need more education, right? And so cities and the FAA has spent a tremendous amount of time trying to educate drone operators, the hobbyists drone operators on how to fly safely and how to avoid any kind of, you know, potential negative conflicts. And then they're the, you know, careless who sort of a little bit about that, but the drone gets away from them or they know, but they do it anyway. And some of these people are the ones who fly over stadiums, you know, that are filled with people just because they think it'd be cool to have aerial photography. And you read about people trying to protect big sporting events and other big outdoor events from these careless operators who know better, but still do it anyway. And then they're the criminal and the criminal are really hard because they will fly, you know, they'll figure out ways to sort of circumvent lots of systems. And so 
one of the big security approaches people have taken towards detecting these malevolent drones is they look for the RF signature of the drone, right, between the controller and the drone itself. And so they say, hey, I've picked up that, you know, there's a signal coming from this location and it's some kind of drone control signal and it's going back and forth to this other location. Well, that's where, you know, where the drone is. And so now I know where it is. But if you don't want to get caught by that, you just tell it to fly by GPS waypoint and turn off your command control link, right? And now the thing can fly essentially blind to all of those traditional systems. And that's where radar comes in as being especially effective is because if it's in the airspace, you're going to see it. You know, you're going to bounce some radio waves off it and get them back and you're going to be able to pinpoint that that thing's there. So I think for cities, you know, they have to keep doing this training. You know, at some point, they're probably going to have to prosecute some of these really careless people who know better, but do it anyway. And we've seen a few prosecutions take place. And then for the really criminal, they're going to have to put in, you know, sort of hardened systems to protect citizens from those particular types of drones. And that's where you're going to have to pick you know, the sort of high value target locations and protect those like big outdoor areas and stadiums and other, you know, large gatherings of people where the most damage might occur. Was there anything more on rogue drones that we need to talk about or did we cover it? One of the challenges I think the FAA is having to deal with is, you know, how do they open up the skies more to commercial drone operators without having a clear counter drone capability, right? So if you're going to say, yeah, we're going to open it up and let lots of people fly, then they need a way to, you know, make it clear that the bad drones are going to be dealt with appropriately and you'll have protection against them. So there's a lot of policy stuff that has to happen there. And then, you know, there are a bunch of counter drone systems that would have to be put in place to make sure the the key sites are protected from, you know, potentially criminal actors. You know, we see a lot of concern, obviously, over prisons. I assume you, you know, hear about that a lot. Stadiums, outdoor venues, you know, federal buildings or other government, state, local buildings, where you could imagine somebody wanting to potentially do harm. As drones become more commonplace in the urban environment, how might that change the way our cities are designed? You know, the urban air mobility... One, you certainly think about, okay, well, we already have helipads in cities on top of skyscrapers. So, you know, you could imagine potentially more helipads or more accessible helipads. Most of the helipads are, you know, are restricted to a very, very small number of of potential clientele. And so how do you spread that out to a larger percentage of the population? So you can definitely imagine, you know, a network of these helipads that have to be thought about and designed into city plans. The other is, you know, how would you deliver a package to somebody in a in a high rise? You know, does it go to the roof and then they have to walk up to the roof and pick it up? Does it get delivered to their balcony? That's a little scary to think about. <laughs> Not a um, a high rise environment, but if you've got individual houses, you know, you could imagine them being delivered into driveways or, or onto front sidewalks, you know, or front walkways or things like that. But yeah, there are a lot of factors that have to get considered for sure if you want this to be widely deployable. I think in downtown sort of core areas, you may see more ground vehicles, you know, may make sense just because it's denser. And so you can, you know, you can have a single ground vehicle making lots of stops just the way they do today and then leave a package inside a building as opposed to via drone. But in the more suburban areas, you could imagine drones being pretty effective. I can see where office buildings or multifamily structures might have an upper floor dedicated to a drone landing bay just to receive deliveries. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. It's the only way it would work. I mean, you definitely aren't going to do it to balconies. I think that's way too challenging of, of a concept of operation. Where do you see the drone industry today? I think the industry is is certainly moving forward. <clears throat> There's a lot of positive development work that's going on. There's more sort of testing every year that takes place to try to prove out that the industry can do these things safely. But it's a big daunting task for the FAA, you know, who has done an an incredible job of producing safe skies for Americans to fly through, right? To make sure that they continue to 
ensure that we have safe skies. And so it's a big daunting task. And, you know, the regulatory side has moved way slower than people in the drone industry would have liked it to, no question. You know, I recognize it's a super challenging problem, but that's something that's got to continue to be worked on, you know, and they're, they're starting to open things up a little more. You know, you hear about some small area has been given clearance to accept some drone deliveries as a test case. And then, you know, there's some other areas where you'll get uh, medical samples being delivered between two hospitals down this, you know, one known corridor and it's below flight lines of, you know, essentially any um, manned aircraft and well-described flight lines. And so the manned aircraft in the area, you know, generally knows that they're there. So we're making a little bit of headway, but it's going to be hard for the drone industry to really move forward and, and move into, you know, big commercial operations the beyond line of sight ones, that is, until we have some big breakthrough on the regulatory side. And I still don't know when that's going to happen. You know, almost all the real commercial business now in in the drone space is all within line of sight, right? So roof inspections, industrial inspections, where the operator is right there. Everything else is pretty much testing. Are you aware of any cities that are ready to serve urban drones? You know, I hear a few cities starting to talk about it. But it's hard to know whether they'll go forward and actually do it or not. We're talking to certainly some cities about this kind of thing, but it's hard to know. You you know, like I said, how do you, who funds this kind of development work or infrastructure work? Is it something cities can put into their budget? And, you know, it's one of those, if you build it, will they come? So if we had the infrastructure, you know, would the commercial operators actually move in and start operating there with the FAA give approval. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of moving parts and everyone's sort of like, well, who moves, you know, which one gets done first, you know, how do they all come together at the same time? So you've got the infrastructure, the FAA approval, you know, the commercial operators all participating at the same time. Cause otherwise you can imagine, you know, a bunch of investment happening and then nothing, you know, and then you just sit there. Right. And for my last question, Eben, what message would you like to leave regarding the future of drones in smart cities? This is a tremendous opportunity and certainly very compelling and would be great for both the citizens of the city as well as operators there. But it all comes down to this airspace awareness question. You know, how do you create sort of full situational awareness of the airspace just to know what is in the air and, and when and where? Once you've got that, the rest of it all gets a lot easier to figure out. So that's, I guess, the big thing I'd leave people with is, you know, how do these cities create situational awareness of their airspace? That's it for episode 266 of the Drone Radio Show. I hope you enjoyed hearing from Eben Frankenberg of Echodyne and hearing how smart cities can play a role in the drone industry. I want to thank Eben for taking the time to speak with me. If you want to learn more about Echodyne or want to connect with Eben, check out the website at echodyne.com. If you like the Drone Radio Show, please consider supporting the podcast with a small donation. The content is always free, but for as little as $1, you can help defray the cost of production. To donate, go to droneradioshow.com slash donate. And thanks for listening. Your support means a lot to me. And I hope you'll listen to more episodes of the Drone Radio Show podcast to hear how others are using drones for business, fun, and research. For the Drone Radio Show, I'm Randy Goers. This has been the Drone Radio Show podcast. More information on today's show can be found on our website at www.droneradioshow.com. If you're using drone technology for business, fun, or research, and would like to share your experience on the show, please visit our website and fill out a guest appearance application. And don't forget to follow us on your favorite social media channels.